Welcome to the Rutgers Community Living Education Project's Epilepsy and Intellectual Developmental Disabilities Learning Series. Today's webinar, Special Considerations for Women with Epilepsy, is being presented by Dr. Dipali Namad, Namade, excuse me, representing the Orlando Health Neuroscience and Rehabilitation Institute. The series is being provided in collaboration with Epilepsy Alliance America and their members. Lisa is joining us from Epilepsy Alliance America. Lisa, would you like to say a few words? Thank you so much. Um, just wanted to really welcome everybody. This is the third in our series today. Um, and we're just so excited to bring you um, Dr. Namadi. She came to us through one of our 19 member organizations across the country. Um, Epilepsy Services Foundation, which is in Tampa, Florida. And I know I'm excited to hear what she's going to say. So I won't say anything else. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Lisa, for your partnership in this series. And my name is Melanie McGacken, and I am representing the Rutgers Community Living Education Project team. Dr. Namade, can you advance the slide? Yes. Thank you. CLEP is a program through the Rutgers University School of Public Health. The CLEP team is committed to providing individual support and resources around the possibilities in community living for people with intellectual and or developmental disabilities in the state of New Jersey. The CLEP team members' contact information is on your screen. Um, Dr. Namadi, can you advance one more time for me, please? Thank you so much. And so please feel free to contact us for any additional information or support when you or someone you know may be ready to explore community living options. So before we get started today, let's go over how you can best participate during today's session. To assure the highest sound quality possible, all attendees will be muted during today's event. To interact with the host or presenters, please use the Q&A option on your screen. We recognize that we learn from each other. So if you know of a great resource to offer, please feel free to share your idea in the chat section of the Zoom control panel with the other attendees for today. At this time, I'm excited to welcome today's presenter, Dr. Namade. Welcome. Thank you, Melanie. Is it, can I start with my talk? Absolutely. Okay, thank you, Melanie, and thank you, Lisa. Uh, thank you, Rutgers School of Public Health for inviting me for this talk. I enjoy you know, creating community awareness. Um, that's one of my passions. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's an honor to speak with you all. So without further ado, let's uh, directly go to our topic. So today's topic is a special consideration for women with epilepsy. Uh, and I'm Dr. Nimade. I'm one of the epileptologists here at Orlando Health uh, Neuroscience Institute. I have no financial disclosure. Uh, objective for today's talk is a focus on health of a women and girls with epilepsy. And some of the topics we are going to discuss today are how hormonal changes affect girls and women with epilepsy how anti-seizure medications may impact birth control or contraception, what are some of the considerations we give before, during, and after the pregnancy, what are the things we, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, breastfeeding, epilepsy, and anti-seizure medication. The next topic would be mature women with epilepsy, menopause, and bone health. And briefly, we are going to talk about intellectual developmental disability in epilepsy and what are some of the things we should keep in mind. And at the end, we are going to talk about some question and answer sessions. So there are 1% of population in the United States alone has epilepsy, which is 3 million, and half of them are women. So 1.5 million are them are uh, women with epilepsy. That's a lot of women with epilepsy. And we need to make sure we create a United States and indirectly world epilepsy free. So that's one of motto of my life. So this is going to be a very informal session. We are going to have discussion and I always take an example and I go with the example because I think we learn from examples. So I'm going to start with the case and my case here is a um, Sanya. Sanya is a 22 year old female. She has a focal epilepsy as an epilepsy coming from one part of the brain and she also has migraines. 
Asanya was started on uh, Valproid, or commonly known as Depakote, when she visited ER when she had a first time or a second time seizure. Uh, when Sanya met me, she told me, I always ask my patient, what are their goals in life? What do they want to achieve apart from, you know, I, me taking care of their epilepsy? So Sanya told me she wants to become a nurse and she would like to have kids in one to two years. Uh, when I talked to her about changing her uh, Valproate or Depakote, she was very hesitant. She said, doctor, I felt best after years. I've been suffering. Nobody believed me I had a seizures. And now I don't want to change my Depakote. But she was very open. She said, why don't you talk to me about different options available and what are their benefits and side effects? I will think about it and I will get back to you. So that's a great start, right? So what do I tell Sanya? Right? So some, I want to talk to you about some of the old anti-seizure medications um, and how they affect women. So Valproate or Depakote, it came in the market in 1960s. So a long time back, almost, you know, uh, more than half a decade. And there are some of the side effects which doesn't make it a fit for some of the women with epilepsy, especially women with a reproductive age group does not necessarily mean it's a bad medication or shouldn't be used in a, um, women at all. But some of the side effects we should keep in mind, and those are women can have a hyperandrogenism, as in some of the male hormones are increased in women's body, and that can lead to hyperpigmentation or skin darkening. Hirsutism, as in excess hair growth on unwanted part of the body while hair loss from your head. Uh, women can have acne. And almost 50 to 60% of women can have a weight gain if they are on Depakote. So definitely doesn't make a good choice for a women of a reproductive age group because all these things matter to a woman, um, how they look. And that, you know, that kind of creates a confidence about how we feel about ourselves, how we are perceived by other people. So pr probably definitely not one of my first choice uh, if there are no other options available. Another medication is phenytoin or commonly known as dilantin. Um, so dilantin also came in market in 1919 or 1910. So I can say more than a century old medication. So dilantin has some acute side effect, like if it is a toxicity, if it is too much taken in the body, it can create a toxicity, which can cause diplopia or double vision, which can lead to, you know, falls or uh, gait imbalance, um, which is not good for people with epilepsy. It can also cause acne. It can cause gum hyperplasia, as in thickening of your gum, which can lead to bleeding. It can also cause birth defect in the baby. And we are going to talk about that in detail in upcoming few slides. It can affect your bones, can make your bone weak and prone for fractures and so on. So again, not a great first choice medication for women of a reproductive age group. Other thing is some of the medications um, or anti-seizure medications, um, they are excreted through the liver, right? And why is it important? Because some of the anti-seizure medication can make your birth control ineffective, leading to unplanned or accidental pregnancy. And why is that? Because birth control uh, pills or birth control methods have estrogen and progesterone. So how does birth control act, right? It kind of fools your brain or a particular pituitary gland, which is a master endocrine or hormonal gland in your brain, to the other part of the body, creating an imbalance between estrogen and progesterone, thus avoiding the pregnancy, right? But if these birth control pills or hormones are excreted or metabolized through the liver, and so are some of the anti-seizure medication. So what, what anti-seizure medication do, they lose or make these birth control methods um, create imbalance, as in that imbalance is lost and you go back to your normal, you know, normal self or your body goes to normal level of your hormones. Plus the birth control pills also increases the uh, metabolism of anti-seizure medication. So efficacy of the anti-seizure medication or effectiveness of anti-seizure medication is also lost. So it causes a rapid clearance of both anti-seizure medication as well as the hormones from your liver, thus making it ineffective. And a lot of women who take anti-seizure medication and they're on one birth control method, they can have accidental pregnancy. 
So whenever uh, I have a women with a reproductive age group or who are able to conceive as in able to get pregnant, I always tell them to use a two types of contraception. So either birth control pills and condoms or IUD and condom, just to make sure that if one method fails, you have a coverage from other method. Plus condoms can also help in prevention of sexually transmitted diseases uh, and so on. So that's why I always educate all my women of a reproductive age group, if they don't want to get pregnant, then use two types of the contraception to avoid that unplanned pregnancy. And I will talk about why it is important to avoid unplanned pregnancy. Now, hormones, how do the hormones affect your seizures, right? So you have estrogen and progesterone, right? So estrogen, that's a hormone which causes excitement of your brain. So it makes seizure more likely when the levels are high, while progesterone, it kind of calms your brain down. So making seizure less likely when the levels are high. So estrogen, it's a bad hormone for seizures, while progesterone is a good hormone for a seizure. So that's why another thing I tell women of a reproductive age group that they should use a progesterone containing hormonal contraceptive pills or progesterone containing, containing birth control pills because it's good for the seizure control as well. Another thing I would like to talk to you all about is a concept of catamenial epilepsy. So what is catamenial epilepsy? So when all women, uh, they come to me with epilepsy, I ask them, why don't you keep a track of what time period during the month your seizure happens? So do they happen during the premenstrual period, during menstruation, pre-ovulatory period, post-ovulatory period? And if we identify that pattern that, hey, I have my seizures when just before my ovulation, or I have my period just after I finish my menstrual cycle, if we identify that pattern, then I add a medication for that period or seven days or two days before or two days after they have a seizure to cover them for that period of the time in the month. So your treatment will be tailored based on your cycle. So it's a very customized treatment for every woman. So I always educate my patient about catamenial epilepsy, that is epilepsy which uh, or seizures which happen during certain period of the menstrual cycle. Okay. Now going back to Sanya, right? Sanya, we talked, she wanted to know about all these things. So we talked to her about different anti-seizure medications, contraception or birth control, catamenial epilepsy, and so on. Now she meets me in the next visit and she's like, doctor, I agree with you. I would like to switch my Valproate or Depakote to Lamotrigine or Lamictal, which is a brand name, 100 milligram twice a day. I also add one milligram folic acid um, to her regimen. So all women of a reproductive age group should be on folic acid because believe it or not, 60% of the pregnancies are accidental, right? And what do the folic acid do? Folic acid protects our, uh, your brain and a spinal cord or what we call neuroprotective as in healthy growth of your brain and spinal cord. Um, and we'll talk about it in upcoming slides as well. I also get Sanya's baseline lamotrigine level so why is baseline lamotrigine level is important? Because if Sanya gets pregnant, there's going to be a physiological weight gain, right? Your body, water like amniotic fluid adds to the weight, baby adds to the weight of the body. So now the way I explain it to my patient is now you had one cup of coffee for that one spoon of sugar was enough. Now you have one and a half cup of coffee or two cups of coffee. Now one spoon of sugar is not going to be enough, right? So as in woman was alone, she was only on 100 milligram twice a day of lamotrigine. Now you add the baby's weight, right? So weight is increased. So 100 milligram twice a day of lamotrigine is not going to be enough. So we need to increase the level of the medication to protect against the seizure. Plus, I do the level. Why is level important? Because it has been shown in the literature, any drop more than 35% from the baseline level can increase the chances of the breakthrough seizure. So I always get the baseline anti-seizure medication level before um, women get pregnant or always have that level available because the only thing I cannot go back is time. And if I lose that time, then I don't know what the baseline level was. So we have Sanya's pre-pregnancy level, which is eight. 
Now, Sanya wants to know what are the effect of anti-seizure and medication and epilepsy during the pregnancy. So let's talk about that next, okay? So planned pregnancy, I always talk to my patients about planned pregnancy. It is extremely important to avoid unplanned pregnancy. And why is it important? Because some of the anti-seizure medication can lead to teratogenicity or birth defect in the babies, right? And that could be a risk to mother's health as well as baby's health. And it is important to have a communication between a patient's neurologist or an epileptologist as in a seizure specialist and OBGYN. And why is, why is it important to have this discussion? Because your epileptologist will decide um, when the women come to me, first I decide, do you really have epilepsy, right? Are anti-seizure medication necessary? Because a lot of time there are wrong diagnosis and the patient stays on a medication which they don't need. So in that case, I take off their medication and then we monitor the women during the pregnancy, make sure she's not having any more seizure. Other thing is some of the syndromes um, are benign epilepsy syndrome. So I had a patient, she was, uh, she had one of the benign epilepsy childhood syndrome and she was put on medication for one breakthrough seizure she had or one seizure she had at the age of six or seven year old. And she came to me when she was 26 and I said, you know, you, you really don't need medication. So I took off her medication or if my patients are seizure free for two or more years, five years, eight years, then I even consider withdrawing an anti-seizure medication. But if I think that my patient really need seizure medication, as in they have epilepsy and that's going to cause problem to the mother and the baby, then what do I do? Then I make sure that I switch them before they get pregnant to a safer anti-seizure medication like a lamotrigine or a capra or a levetiracetam is a generic name, which are considered safer medication during the pregnancy as compared to valproate or dilantin or phenobarbital and so on. If they are on multiple medication, then I switch them to lesser medication and increase the existing doses of the medication to make sure they're better covered. And I also add a folate supplementation or a folic acid um, supplement um, before the pregnancy, during the pregnancy, and after the pregnancy. So what are some of the newer anti-seizure medication which are safer for the women, right? I talked about few of them, like a lamotrigine. It has a good data in the literature. Levetiracetam, or commonly known as Keppra. Breviracetam, or commonly known as Breviac, which is a brand name, uh, probably low chances, or there is not much data, but most of the women do well on this medication. Oxcarbazepine also has a good data. One more thing is once women are pregnant and they come at a certain time period during their pregnancy, let's say they are 12 weeks or 15 weeks or 16 weeks, and I think they need their medication, they have epilepsy, then I decide, is it worth switching their medication at this point? Because risk of having a seizure when you're switching the medication is much higher as compared to the benefit because when you cross certain periods during the pregnancy, when the baby's organs are formed, then the risk of the seizure medication causing birth defect goes down because whatever damage has done, it's already done. There's no point switching medication at that point. Uh, but the risk, if the mother has seizure, then it's a risk for mother's health as well as baby's health. And my next slides will explain that better. So as you can see, this is a, you know, ovum uh, or a fertilized ovum, right? And it's growing into uh, every week into this baby, which is 38 weeks. As you can see, these red lines here, those red lines indicate highly sensitive period. And what are highly sensitive period? This is a period during which your baby's organs are formed. And this is up to 16 weeks, as you can see, when the baby's organs are formed. So during this, if Women, by the time they know they are pregnant, eight weeks are gone, right? We all know that. And then you have eight weeks. At that point, I decide, is it worth taking the risk to switch the medication? And if it is not, then I keep them, even though some of the medication like Valproate, I don't switch the medication because it's not worth taking the risk. So once the, once the women cross or babies cross a critical period of development, then your seizure doctor or epileptologist or neurologist might not switch your medication. 
Now, what are some of the um, birth defect or congenital malformation? And what is, what's the percentage of the risk associated, right? So four to 7% of the birth to the epileptic women have birth defect or congenital malformation, which is two to three times higher than the general population, which is two to 3%, right? What are the factors which increase the risk of the birth defect? One is type of the anti-seizure medications. Second is polytherapy, as in they are on multiple medications which have a high risk of causing a birth defect. High treatment dose, as in like a Topamax uh, or a Topiramate, if it is goes above certain like 250, 300, 400 milligram, then the risk of the birth defect goes higher because some of the seizure medication has uh, dose dependent chances of having the birth defect and topomax is one of them if women is not taking folic acid during the pregnancy or before they got pregnant that increases the risk of um, babies having birth defect if there's a family history of birth defect so if there is a genetic predisposition that increases the risk now something important i would like to talk to you is let's say women is on valproate right or a depakote uh, she goes to a seizure doctor and doctor says, you know, the risk is too high. We should not change the medication. She stays on a medication, right? So let's think about two scenarios, right? One scenario is baby has a birth defect. And second scenario is baby is born with the uh, baby is not born with a birth defect, as in baby does not have any birth defect or a healthy baby, right? If baby has a birth defect during the previous pregnancy, then the subsequent pregnancy, even the women stays on a Depakote, the chances of the next baby developing birth defect is 35%. But let's say the pregnancy, uh, the woman delivered a healthy baby, baby did not have any birth defect, then the risk is only 3%, which is equivalent to the general population. So that's something I would like to, you know, you all to keep in mind that if there's a previous pregnancy with birth defect, then obviously the chances of baby in a subsequent pregnancy to develop the birth defect is higher or as high as 35%. But if the previous pregnancies um, have delivered healthy babies, then subsequent pregnancies, the risk goes significantly uh, less or subsequent, uh, significantly down. Now, what are some of the birth defect, right? Or a teratogenic defect? So I divided them into two uh, to make it simplify, right? One is minor anomalies and the second one is major anomalies. So minor anomalies are, they do not cause threat to the health. They do not require any intervention. These are cosmetic defects. They do not impair any function. Like you can see in the first picture here, uh, the baby is having a malformed ear or a micro otia or a small ear. But that's not causing a significant impairment of function. Baby is able to hear okay and everything. So this is a minor anomaly. But if you look at the second picture here, this is a major anomaly, as in a physical defect which require medical or surgical intervention. They cause a major functional problem. They cause threat to the baby's health, just like shown in here. Like let's say baby is having a hole in the heart or baby is having spina bifida or spinal cord defect or neural tube defect. So these are called major malformation, while up is a minor malformation or a cosmetic defect, I call them. Now, what are some of the principles of management of uh, epilepsy in women during the reproductive years, right? So we, I talked about folic acid supplements. Why is it important? So folic acid uh, is very important for the growth, healthy growth of the baby's brain and the spinal cord. So you saw on the previous slide, the baby had the picture with the spina bifida or a neural tube defect. The chances of that goes fourfold down if woman is taking a folic acid during the pregnancy. Okay, so that's why I tell all my women, irrespective if they have epilepsy or not, uh, they should be on at least one milligram of folic acid per day, right? And it's not only folic acid, women should also avoid, you know, um, alcohol, tobacco, or a drug use during the pregnancy because that also can cause the birth defect for the babies. 
Now coming back to Sanya, right? Sanya conceives uh, after six months uh, of the pregnancy. Uh, uh, conceives after six months, she first visited the visited the doctor or me. Now she is doing a frequent visit to with her seizure doctor. Her seizure doctor is monitoring her levels. She is making sure there is open communication between her OBGYN and epilepsy physician. Um, and despite of doing all that, Sanya does have a breakthrough seizure in her first trimester, right? So she calls her seizure doctor. She says, hey, doc, I had my first seizure um, because I had a tongue bite and uh, it was lasted for like 30 seconds to a minute. So her seizure doctor increases her lamotrigine to 150 milligram twice a day from 100 milligram twice a day. And her levels, look at the levels, they dropped to four. What were her pre-pregnancy level? If you all remember, they were eight. So 50% drop, right? In the last trimester. So her epileptologist, even though she did not have any breakthrough seizure in the last trimester, she goes to uh, increase her lamotrigine uh, medication to 200 milligram twice a day. Now, some, what are some of the aspects of management of these seizure medication level? Because all my patients who are pregnant and have epilepsy, they ask me, how often do I have to do these levels, doc? So I tell them it's exactly like how you visit your OBGYN. So I try to schedule their appointment, which are coinciding with their OB appointment. That way they don't have to make two different visits. Um, or some of the labs, I make sure I, I arrange them when they are doing the labs with OB people so that the women don't have to, you know, go for multiple lab tests and things like that. Now, how often do we monitor these levels? So as I said, during the pregnancy, now anti seizure medication level goes down because there is a physiological weight gain. There is a physiological volume overload. So... First, I obviously get the baseline or a preconception level or a pre-pregnancy level. And that is a most important one because that will help your doctor, a seizure doctor or a neurologist to manage your epilepsy better. Then I get at the beginning of each trimester. Sometimes I do even monthly if patients are having more breakthrough seizures or there is a there is a um a question of non-compliance, as in women sometimes, even though their doctor tells them to take medication, um, <clears throat> women don't take medication because they feel it is the medications are doing more harm to the babies than benefit. And let me tell you, that's the most harmful thing to do. You will do to your baby than you know not taking medication because if you have a seizure, what happens? You stop breathing, right? your placenta contracts, there is a blood flow going to the baby goes down, right? Uh, you can, mother can fall if they have a seizure. If they fall, what will happen? Trauma and trauma can happen to mother as well as baby. So not taking medication if you have epilepsy is much, much, much more harmful than taking medication. So coming back to the level, um, you do the baseline, then beginning of each trimester. Then also um, I do as soon as the mother delivers, because as soon as you deliver, baby is out of your body, right? So your weight is going to go back at least after six weeks, it will go back to your pre-pregnancy level. Or if not pre-pregnancy, it's going to go significantly down. So now you don't need as much medication to protect against the seizure as compared to what you needed in the pregnancy, right? So we do the levels and then we slowly go down on your anti-seizure medication dose. And within three to four months after the delivery, they go back to mostly pre-pregnancy dosage of their seizure medication. And that generally your epileptologist or a seizure doctor or neurologist will talk to your OBGYN that as soon as the mother deliver, please make sure they get the levels done and adjust the seizure medication accordingly, okay? Now, who should get this screening for the birth defect, right? Or a congenital malformation. So all women in general should go for this checkup, but women with epilepsy must go for screening for congenital malformations especially women who are taking valproate or carbamazepine. What time it is done? It's done around 18 to 20 weeks of pregnancy. And what are the ways you can do this? So one is by doing blood test. Second is by doing ultrasound, right? 
And if your OB has a question that, oh, there's something going on with the baby, they might order something called amniocentesis, as in they will put the needle in um, the women's uterus and take some amniotic fluid and send it for genetic analysis. And your OB should talk to you about the risk of amniocentesis uh, with you if they are planning to do one for you. Now, peripartum management, as in when women get delivered, some of the women who don't have epilepsy, they also have a seizure during, you know, when they do delivery. Um, so here's, I want to talk to you, an uh, important concept of eclampsia, right? Eclampsia is very, very different than epilepsy, right? So let's talk about what is preeclampsia first. So women who get pregnant during the pregnancy, they can develop high blood pressure, they develop protein in their urine, as in they pee, there is high amount of protein in their urine and they develop swelling in their leg. If there is this, all three exist during the pregnancy, it's called preeclampsia. And if this woman with a preeclampsia, if they get a convulsion and it is not caused by pre-existing epilepsy, but the woman never had a seizure, but she had convulsion, that's called eclampsia. And the management of this eclampsia is very, very different. These women don't go on a seizure medication for lifelong. They stay for a couple months or three months and it's taken off, right? So I would like all you, all of you to understand this is very different than having a epilepsy. Being said that, all women with epilepsy, there is a slight increased risk of seizure during and immediately after labor. That is 2 to 4%. And I always talk to all my patients about and their OB doctor about it and how to manage those. Now, coming back to Sanya. Sanya is taking now 200 milligram twice a day of lamotrigine. She delivers a healthy baby girl via normal vaginal delivery. Now, immediately after the delivery, her levels are 12, which is high, right? So she calls her epileptologist or a seizure doctor. A seizure doctor says, okay, let's go back to 150 milligram twice a day, right? And then at six to eight weeks, we do the repeat level and she goes back to her pre-pregnancy seizure medication dose, which is 100 milligram twice a day. Now let's talk about safety during the postpartum period. So I tell all my women who delivered the baby because they take care um, when they are pregnant and everything. And during the postpartum period, all women, they forget about themselves, right? Because all they care about is a baby. Um, and their babies are, they wake up every two hours, right? So there is a lot of sleep deprivation or sleep interruption. And what does that cause? Sleep deprivation it causes a breakthrough seizure, right? Plus you're taking, if you're, if this is your first baby, or even if it is subsequent baby, it's added stress. There is a lack of routines. And sometimes you're so busy taking care of the baby, you forget to take your own medication and that can lead to a breakthrough seizure. Plus there are physiologically some changes which happen in the hormone that can also increase the risk of seizures as well, right? So make sure you take care of yourself first, right? And then baby and get help, right? So if your mom and dad wants to help, Ask them to, you know, come and help with you so that you can get your six to eight hours of sleep, right? And remember, dads are part of family too. So let them take care of the baby, especially during nighttime, because that's when you need your sleep, right? When you're changing your baby's diaper, make sure you're changing at the low or ground level, because what if you have a seizure, um, if the baby is on the changing station and so on. So always safe to change the diaper on the ground. If you're bathing the baby, make sure your supervisor, somebody in the house um, to make sure you are safe and your baby is safe, right? Now, your seizure doctor should follow your anti-seizure medication level and they should adjust the medication level during the postpartum period as in when once women deliver the baby, right? Now, another question I get asked by all the women, can I breastfeed my baby? And my answer is yes, right? Because it's golden milk, right? It has a lot of protective properties. It provides immunity to your babies. And it's an important motherhood experience. So 
I tell all my women uh, who are, uh, not all, most of them uh, who are on anti-seizure medication to breastfeed their baby. But you have to keep in mind that all anti-seizure medication do cross the breast, uh, um, do cross into breast milk. So sometimes it is case to case basis. There are a few women uh, who I don't allow to breastfeed their babies. But the general consensus is that uh, most of the women, it should be feasible for them to breastfeed their babies. Just make sure you monitor your babies for sedation because these seizure medications are going to go in your uh, baby's um, body as well via breast milk, but it should be safe. Now, coming back to Sanya, uh, Sanya decides to breastfeed her baby. Remember, she was on Lamotrigin, one of the safer medication. She and baby are doing very well. She is still following with her epileptologist and OBGYN. Now she's a part of epilepsy group on a social media. She is talking to other patients or other women like her or, a, you know, colleagues of her who are suffering from epilepsy. She's helping them out with her experience. She does ask all the concerns to her doctor and she's doing very well. Now, after three years, uh, Sanya's epilepsy is unfortunately has become a little intractable. Now, she went from one medication to two anti-seizure medications. Now, she asked again her uh, seizure doctor and OB that she wants to have one more baby, right? So, they again work as a team. Uh, Sanya has a second healthy baby boy. She has a safe pregnancy. She's doing very well and Sanya is a nurse now, right? Now, one day, uh, Sanya comes to my clinic and um, she discusses about a decreased sexual drive or a libido. Um, and she discusses that with her OBGYN as well. Um, so I talk to her, I give her more resources and things she can do. And that brings to my next topic, sexuality and anti-seizure medication. So sexual health is important part of the uh, women's life. And women with epilepsy experience significantly more sexual difficulties than men. Some epilepsy um, or a certain type of epilepsy, like a temporal lobe epilepsy, they can have a higher dysfunction as compared to the extra temporal lobe epilepsy. Some medication like valproate, dilantin, carbamazepine, phenobarbital, topiramate, it can cause sexual dysfunction or a decreased um, uh, sexual drive, while certain medication like Lamictal, Levitracetam, uh, it may improve your sexual function. So please do talk to your seizure doctor and OB if you are experiencing this particular side effect. Now, after 10 years, Sanya is an epilepsy advocate. Uh, she's educating patient about epilepsy, um, effect of anti-seizure medication at her job and now she wants to know what are the long-term effect of being on anti-seizure medication for the rest of her life and epilepsy. Um, excuse me. Now one of the things I talk to all my patients with epilepsy is a epilepsy, um, anti-seizure medication, and bone health, right? So certain anti-seizure medication uh, like dilantin, carbamazepine, valproic acid, they have direct effect on your bone health. Epilepsy can affect your bone health in various ways. Like epilepsy, it can cause seizures. Seizures can cause falls and falls can cause fractures, right? Then Anti-seizure medication a side effect like dilantin. Uh, if you remember, we talked about dilantin causes uh, diplopia or double vision, right? It can cause a gait imbalance, uh, which can lead to falls and that can lead to fractures. Then some of the anti-seizure medication itself has a direct effect on your bone cells. It can cause a hormonal, um, you know, endocrine disruptive effect, and that can affect your bone cell metabolism excuse me, which can lead to a decreased bone mineral density and bone strength, and that can lead to fracture. Certain sections of the society have a higher um, um, bone health issues than other. For example, somebody with a low socioeconomic status, as in their diet is not good, or if there is a family history or genetic predisposition for a osteoporosis or a poor bone health, then those people have will have more bone health issues as compared to the other um, part of the society. 
So what should you do, right? So I tell all my patients who are on anti-seizure medication to take calcium and vitamin D. I check their vitamin D, um, not, if not every six monthly, at least annually. And after a certain age, I also do a DEXA scan or a bone scan um, every two to five years. And if they have osteoporosis um, or osteopenia, then I send them to either endocrinology for treatment with bisphosphonate, albendronate, and so on. Now, epilepsy and perimenopause, right? So it has been shown in the literature that women with epilepsy uh, develop a premature ovarian failure, as in menopause, before the age of 40. And that happens in 5% of the women with epilepsy. And the menopause occurs earlier by three to six years. So what, what can it lead to? It can lead to a few things. A, because there is an imbalance between the hormone, it can lead to an increased uh, seizure uh, tendency or increased breakthrough seizures, right? Some women with a menopause um, or an earlier menopause, they go on a hormonal replacement therapy. So if your hormone replacement therapy has more estrogen into it, then that can lead to increased breakthrough seizures. Um, so I always educate my uh, patients who want to go on HRD. I tell them if it has a more estrogen and if your seizures are increasing, please let me know and we can always discuss benefit versus risk ratio and we can manage to improve your quality of life, right? Some of my patients who had catamenial pattern, as in they had seizures because of that increased estrogen uh, during certain period of their menstrual cycle, then if they, uh, if they have a menopause, their seizures actually improve. So that confirms that, you know, again, that women had a catamenial pattern. And again, menopause can itself, um, either you have epilepsy or not, Menopause itself can uh, increase the chances of a symptomatic bone disease. So women have a higher risk of developing osteoporosis as compared to men because of that estrogen, because estrogen is required for a, um, a bone strength or bone development. Now, the next and I think uh, the uh, last uh, topic for my today's talk is epilepsy and intellectual and developmental disability, right? It's very important to talk about this. So epilepsy is common in people who are intellectual um, and have a developmental disability. And some of the common syndrome, not necessarily with the women, but we can see in the men, as well are Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, Dravet syndrome, tuberous sclerosis, right? And it is very important for a, for a women or a men who have intellectual and developmental disability and have epilepsy to get the right diagnosis. Because I have a patient, I have a few patients who tell me, well, you know, my son's or my daughter's brain is bad anyway. Why do I need to do all this genetic analysis? Why do I need to go through this scan? Just manage the epilepsy and we are done. I said, no, 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 we need to get the right diagnosis because if you have a right diagnosis, that will lead to a proper treatment. We can certain medication work better for certain syndromes. Then I, I will be able to uh, prognosticate or will be able to kind of know what's going to happen in the future about the clinical course of that uh, patient's um, um, development. Like certain syndrome um, have a bad prognosis while certain syndrome have a good prognosis. Uh, certain people with certain genetic abnormality uh, develop certain type of issues and we'll be able to manage those better if we have a diagnosis. So it's if your doctor, seizure doctor or neurologist suggest uh, and if your kid uh, have intellectual and developmental disability, I call them my special kids, right? So if, if my special kids need genetic analysis, I encourage all parents to um, go through the genetic analysis to get a definitive diagnosis. And sometimes we may, might not get the answers we are looking for, but it's good to try, right? Other thing which go, goes ignored um, in the my special kids is a psychiatric issue or a mental health issues and sleep disorders. Because, you know, these are special kids. Sometimes they are not able to communicate with you the kind of problems they have. So it's very important to pay attention to their sleep patterns or how, how they're feeling. They feel depressed. They feel sad. They feel, you know, happy. So it's very important to 
because it's all boils down to the quality of life and I want my special kids to have a good quality of life and you know day filled with fun and laughter and so on I also sometimes send my special kids for holistic approaches as well apart uh, apart from doing the <clears throat> Uh, seizure medication and you know um, psychiatric help and so on um, also when I get this my special kids they are generally adults um, but I always you know uh, talk to my pediatric counterpart or pediatric seizure specialist <clears throat> that they should start this transition at the age of 12 or 14 itself because I, I don't know how many of you know, like when you go from your pediatric doctor who you stayed with like 18 years and 20 years and you're going to the adult doctor, it's hard. Change is hard for, you know, normal people. And my special kids are even harder time when they get transitioned from a pediatric uh, specialist to an adult specialist. So uh, this require a... <clears throat> a uh, special transition um, and a counseling when this transition happens. So there are minimal uh, care of standards for adults with intellectual and developmental disability. And some of them I already discussed about. Um, another thing I would like to discuss with you is some of my special kids, you know, they need certain kind of seizure medication. They do very well by certain medication. They don't do very well. I talk to them as well about, you know, risk of SUDEP or a sudden unexpected death with epilepsy. Uh, I talk to them about epilepsy surgeries, right? So some of my uh, special kids parents, oh, he has epilepsy. We know he's not going to do well. I, why do we need to do brain surgery? I said, no, because, you know, certain surgeries will improve the quality of life. For example, um, kids with Lennox Gusta, if they get corpus callosotomy, which is a type of surgery, then their generalized tonic-clonic seizures and a tonic seizure where they fall, they they go down significantly. And imagine if the kid with epilepsy, if falling is a seizure, if they go down, that decreases a significant harm to my uh, special kids, um, then that will decrease the significantly ER visits and you know a trauma to their head and fractures and so on. So if your doctor, be open to talk to your doctor about different surgical therapies for special kids. Dietary therapy, like ketogenic diet, um, that is also one of the important aspects for special kids. Psychiatrist. Um, I ask all my special kids to see psychiatrists. Your mental health is just like having epilepsy, just like having somebody having diabetes or hypertension. It's very important to find a, a not only a seizure doctor, but also a um, mental health provider or a psychiatrist who can work with you and your kid to improve the quality of life. And the last but not the least important is um, because intellectual disability uh, can range from you know, mild to severe. And some of uh, my women uh, who have mild intellectual disability, they want to get pregnant, they want to have a kid. And if you are able to take care of their kid, I, I give them that chance of having you know, um, a kid I, because that gives them a happiness. But some of who have severe mental disability who cannot care for themselves, then I talk to their parent about a birth control or a contraception for their kids um, based on what the parent wants, based on what the patient wants, how much patient's uh, capacity to understand uh, exists and so on. Because sometimes it's big, bad world out there, right? And you want to protect your kid no matter what. Um, so I always talk about that as well. I also talk to parents about if my special kids start losing weight, if they are, I notice behavioral changes because after first, second visit, we kind of become friends. And if I see that they are not giving me high five, they are not behaving in particular way, I talk to the parents, um, what's going on? What happened? And, you know, then I come to know, oh, he was sick or she was sick and so and so and happened or their pet um, died or somebody you know close to their family member died and so on so these kids um special kids we need to take care of them just like everybody else um and i think that's all i have for today and it 
it's a big talk and I try to, you know, um, concise it as much as possible uh, because of the time constraint. But I think I'm ready to take a question if Melanie allows me to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Namade. Um, so we do actually have quite a few questions coming in. Uh, Dr. Namade, I know that you and I spoke previously. If some of these questions um, may need very specific um, guidance from an individual's doctors. So if um, Dr. Namade, if you're comfortable answering a question in as general as terms as possible, would be greatly appreciated. Um, so first is how frequently would you have a bone density test? Okay, so all the women of a reproductive age group, I monitor their vitamin D levels, right? If their vitamin D levels goes down, and especially the DEXA scan, I do when they reach that perimenopausal level. Or let's say I have like 30-year-old and had a bone fracture. I'm like, 30-year-old shouldn't have a bone fracture, right? Uh, that's no, no. And that time we, we need to investigate why 30-year-old is having, you know, bone fractures. So we can do DEXA scan acutely in that period. But generally during the perimenopausal or postmenopausal period is that's when I order the um, DEXA scan for them. Thank you. And can you talk a little bit more about rescue medications during pregnancy? Very good question, okay? And I get this question a lot, and thank you for pointing that out. Um, so rescue medication during pregnancy, I give rescue medication during pregnancy um, uh, to all my women, especially if they're having intractable epilepsy. I just tell them to make sure before, so rescue medication is your um, inhaled um, uh, diazepam, um, or a lorazepam, um, a versa, or midazolam, nasolam, or the valtecor, the two commonly brand, uh, known commonly brand used, right? So I just tell them to make sure um, the patient is breathing okay. Make sure, you know, you're not having anything around the neck. Neck is not constrained. Don't put anything in the mouth. Make sure you time your seizure and give the inhale. Thank, thank God, right? Somebody came up with the inhaled stuff or nasal, right? because originally we used to use the rectal one. Um, and that used to be, you know, just to tell is to be um, um, traumatic for me. So I cannot imagine how traumatic it would be for a patient who is having seizures and getting rectal stuff. But anyhow, we have nasal. So you can uh, spray the nasal thing, wait for five minutes, make sure you monitor the breathing, Make sure you're not using any kind of like spoons in your mouth or fingers in your mouth. Don't make them inhale ammonia. Don't make, make them inhale onion and, you know, whatever you do. Because tongue is impossible to swallow. It's the strongest muscle in your body. Okay. So, I yeah, I do encourage using a rescue medication to some of my women who have intractable epilepsy. Or if some of them have a nocturnal seizures. So we're actually getting a lot of questions and please correct me if I'm saying it incorrect. Catamenial epilepsy? Yeah. Um, so we have a lot of questions around that topic. So I'm going to try to quickly get um, mm -hmm. a few of these in. Um, what percentage of women are diagnosed? So around seven to eight percent, I based on if you're asking worldwide or you know in US and different countries, it's different a percentage, but less than ten percent uh, have a catamenial epilepsy for a women with epilepsy. Um, and and can you talk a little bit about um, diagno diagnosis criteria? Does it take a certain um, number of menstrual cycles of tracking? Um, how does that typically work for diagnosis? Yeah, so the women who have a regular menstrual cycle or 28 or 38 days where we are able to define, you know, pre-ovulatory, uh, post-ovulatory, uh, pre-menstrual, uh, luteal phase, these are different phases of the menstrual cycle. If I'm able to track them for like six months or eight months and I'm able to uh, come out with a certain pattern uh, in the setting of a regular menstrual cycle, then we diagnose it as a catamenial epilepsy. And can you talk a little bit about the kinds of seizures that someone may present with under the catamenial? Yeah, so there are various uh, genetic uh, um, syndromes which can be associated with it. Uh, some of them might not be a genetic syndrome. It could be any epilepsy, um, essentially. Uh, but if remember, the estrogen is makes you to have seizure uh, because it 
it's a chemical, it creates a chemical imbalance where your GABA goes down, so your seizures increases. I should not talk about very medical term, but I don't know how else to explain it. But essentially, the estrogen increases the risk of having a um, breakthrough seizures, and that's why we call it catamenial epilepsy. And can you talk a little bit about um, the kind of medications that may be prescribed to someone for those um, couple of days before or after their menstrual cycle? Yeah, so there are a few medication. Uh, my favorite one is Clobizam or the brand name is Onfi. I start like two to, two to three days before if we come up with a pattern, then let's say like on, let's say 12th day of my menstrual cycle, I have a seizure. So I say, okay, let's start from 10th day five milligram you take it and then we figure out is it during the morning you have a seizure during the night you have a seizure based on the time and then you can take it two days before two three days during and two three days after and that's it done seven days um during that pattern once we identify and uh, my patient take medication during only that particular cycle if that makes sense we have uh, someone asking uh, specifically if um, if their epilepsy is affected by their cycle, but um, progestion um, only pills gave the person seizures. Does that mean that they have catamenia epilepsy? So um, it's hard to answer that question because I don't know a lot of details if you're asking about your personal thing because we need to figure out there are certain other things we need to exclude to make sure you get a proper diagnosis of catamenial epilepsy. In fact, I recommend progesterone only pills for a woman uh, with a catamenial epilepsy for the birth control. So I don't know, we'll ha you'll have to talk to your doctor about that. Right. Um, I do see someone uh, providing some comments in regards to epilepsy and pregnancy and uh, the person shared that um, age is also a risk and they were on trileptal and over 35, but delivered a healthy baby and was monitored constantly. Absolutely right. Age itself, if even if you are a healthy, you know, as in you don't have epilepsy or any other health condition, age itself is a risk factor for, which increases the risk of having a birth defect or certain kind of genetic problems. So yes, plus if you are um, have epilepsy on top of that, increases the risk further. And unfortunately, fortunately, we live in the world where, you know, most of the women are delivering later and later in their life because we are all career oriented women, right? So most of the women deliver babies after 30. So yeah, here we are. Absolutely, right? Um, what do you do? And I think you covered this um, after this question was asked, but if you could just briefly give um, some comment around what do you do um, with a patient after the baby is born in regards with having to wake up multiple times in the middle of the night and mm -hmm. getting sleep deprived? Very good question. And all my patients ask me about that. So remember, dads are part of family too, right? So they need to be put on night call, just like you're taking care of the baby during the day. Ask your family member if your mother wants to help, um, uh, your mother-in-law wants to help, or your friends wants to help, hire a nanny if possible, right? And other thing I tell all my uh, women with epilepsy, take a nap when your baby takes a nap. That's the best way you'll recover the sleep, but take help of your family because sleep deprivation is a major risk factor for breakthrough seizure. Right. Yeah, reach out where you can. Yep. And um, is an IUD be uh, the best birth control option for women with epilepsy? So it depends on um, who you are, what your other health conditions are, right? But if you are... Um, it's normally, I can say a blanket statement might not be true for every patient, but most of my women with epilepsy, they prefer IUD plus condoms um, for the birth control as compared to other women. Um, you know, um, some of them are on depo shot, but because they can't do IUD. So these are exception, uh, but most of them prefer. Beautiful. Um, I have someone also sharing that they had seizures both during ovulation and their period, and they tried various forms of BCP. Well, I don't know what BCP is. I am not sure either. So if that um, person would like to clarify, please feel free uh, to. Probably she means birth control pills. 
that would that would that would uh, make sense, right? Uh, so um, I, I'm not sure if that person had a specific question um, or if they were just sharing. So if you have a specific question, please feel free. Um, and I see we're over time. Uh, Dr. Namade, do you have a couple more minutes? Yes, I'll take a few more questions. Perfect. I, I will be very conscious of your time. I appreciate that. Um, and just to let everyone know that um, this session is recorded and we will make sure to share this over the next week once it does get posted to YouTube um, under the Community Living Education Project page. So we will get that out. I uh, just want to make sure I saw that there were some questions coming through the chat. I think I moved most of them over. Um, and again, I, I think this information was really relevant, right, to people of all ages, uh, female of all ages, and and um, anyone who provides treatment, support, or care. So uh, greatly appreciated. I think that this is um, a lot of information, whether you have you know, our children, our young daughters um, who may have a diagnosis of epilepsy or if someone themselves is already an adult. So um, I think all this information is going to be very relevant and allowing um, people of all ages to explore, you know, maybe some of these new possibilities that they didn't know about and also um, to explore, you know, specifically with their doctors what treatments may be right for them. I think that's the really important piece to this is that treatment has to be very individualized. Absolutely. You make a great point, Melanie. Yeah. So we do, I, I think some clarification was given. Um, I had catamenia epilepsy and tried progesterone only pills. I couldn't move at all. I tried the ring and then I tried the... I apologize. Um, Lou, I'm not sure, Dr. Nameda, if you can look at the question and answer section, because I want to be conscious not to mispronounce. I think she's trying to say that I try Lozia Sonic. Uh, I think it's type of a birth control uh, method. Thank you. Thank you. If you want to finish that question, please. Yeah, which had a very low dose of progesterone and estrogen. I skipped the final dose of estrogen and they seem to help with my catamenial epilepsy and migraine. Bravo, very good. So yeah, you. sometimes it takes trials and error to figure out. So it's most important that, you know, you work with your uh, um, seizure doctor and neurologist. I tell them this is a relationship which works on honesty, just like any other relationship. Absolutely. So I do want to get to the, our final question before we say goodbye. Um, have you noticed any links and anything positive um, in regards to treatment for people, um, women with both epilepsy and endometriosis? Mm, thank you, Catherine, for your question. I'm not sure about that, but I will look it up and I will send the Melanie link if I find anything. I don't know for sure and I don't want to give a half-baked answer, so I'll look it up. Wonderful. Dr. Namadi, thank you so much for your time and expertise today. Uh, the Community Living Education Project, um, Epilepsy Alliance America, greatly appreciate your time and dedication to the community. So thank you so much for sharing as always. Lisa, do you have any final words before we say goodbye? I do not. Just thank you so much. I certainly learned a lot and I'm sure everyone else did. Dr. Namade, thank you again. Um, as we're preparing to say goodbye today, everyone's going to see a very brief survey pop up on their screen, takes about 30 seconds, multiple choice. If you would do that, would be greatly appreciated. It's the information that you provide to us and allows us to better focus our future sessions on information that is most relevant to the um, individuals, families, and professionals that we support. Dr. Namade, thank you again. Uh, we look forward uh, to future relationships and thank you. Have a thank you, time. Melanie. And thank you, uh, Lisa. And thank you, Rutgers Public Health Team. I really enjoyed this. Um, I wish this was in person so that I can see the faces I'm talking with. But yeah, I look forward to future talks and thank you for the opportunity to create awareness. Thank you, everyone. Be well. Yeah, bye.